Hello, so welcome. Uh, what we're going to do in this uh, video is we're going to go over the basics of writing a philosophy paper. So your final is coming up and I want to give you an overview of how you're supposed to construct a philosophy paper, um, what tips, what issues you should be looking out for, things like that, the expectations of the assignment. So writing a philosophy paper is basically writing an argument or essay. Well, what does that mean? Well, an argument with essay is where you take a particular position on a particular issue. So you're arguing for or against something and you're trying to make that point, backing it up with reasons. So you need some good, strong reasons for what you're saying. You can't simply say, well, it's my opinion or I kind of thing like this. I noticed that in a lot of the discussions, people were trying to say, well, you know, I guess whatever. But here you really need to, it's almost like a court case. You really need to prove something and make a point. So let's get into it and see what the overall uh, assignment is about and what you're gonna have to do. So as I say in this uh, prompt for the final, I say, in this final essay, you're going to utilize what you've comprehensively learned from the course and choose a section of philosophy recovered to help identify and analyze problems that arise in your chosen field of study, i.e. psychology, criminal justice, physics, whatever, etc. Right? So let's break it down. Let's go back and kind of let me explain what I mean by that. And if I'm getting, a, if it looks a little distracting that I'm looking to my right, it's because I have two screens. It just makes it easier for me to kind of navigate everything. So when I say comprehensively, it's everything that we went over in a course is fair game. So all the way from the first week to now, to the very end, you're going to use, you're welcome to use any of the subjects or any of the philosophers or any of the issues that we went over to make that connection to your current field of study. And what you're trying to identify here is a particular problem in your field of study that's related to one of the issues that we talked about in class and also then give an analysis for it. This is where the argument part is kind of coming in there. Of is this a solvable problem? Is this not a solvable problem? Uh, how would we try to solve this problem in that field uh, with what we know about philosophy and stuff? So that's kind of the approach you're going to do here. And don't worry, your philosophy paper kit is going to be easy to relate to any field of study. So psychology major, criminal justice, physics, you can be a music major. Uh, you can be an art major, history, it doesn't matter. Philosophy is the foundation for every discipline that you learn about, math, whatever. And there are philosoph philosophical problems there. So don't worry about what it's going to be and uh, what your major is going to be or if you're going to be able to relate it or not. If you need my help, please contact me. I'll walk you through. I'll try to help you, you know, uh, but Trust me, you can relate it to any subject that you're studying. Now, I do make a caveat that maybe you haven't decided at this point uh, what you're going to major in. So, uh, or you can still kind of investigate if you're kind of curious about psychology, want to know more about it. You can still, for example, go that way, or you can chose, uh, choose, I'm sorry, a personal life problem. And this is why philosophy is such a great foundation for everything. Even your personal life, even your personal problem, you can still address those problems using philosophy. And that's what we learned about a lot of these philosophers. They're trying to solve things that they face in life, uh, situations. This is not just about writing books or anything. This is actually real problem solving here. Now, how are you gonna do that? Well, you're gonna use some of the perspectives that we learned about. This is what I'm saying. You're connecting what you've learned about in the book. We went over some logic, which is going to force come, going to come back again. And really importantly, in this even 
how to write this paper, you're gonna need some good logic to back it up, right? So logic, metaphysics, so reality, right? The basis of what is real or not. Uh, axiology, uh, that includes value judgments of any sort of good. When you talk about things that are good or things are bad, things are right or things are wrong. So <clears throat> things are beautiful, things are ugly. Aesthetics is about beauty, right? Making those judgments about beauty. Justice is making uh, those judgments that we looked at about what is right or wrong, or what is just and what is unjust. Uh, ethics in general, but we didn't spend too much time on the ethics chapter uh, because I teach an ethics course, so the whole thing is about ethics, but definitely you see justice and you see all sorts of ethical issues still come up about what's right and wrong. Uh, epistemology, which is the study of knowledge in general, so this is what I'm saying, it can be connected to any type of major uh, Definitely, it's easy for psychology, right? Uh, what do we consider learning? What do we consider knowledge? Uh, criminal justice, how do we know somebody's innocent or guilty? How do we determine that, right? There's where the uh, justice part comes in as well. Uh, physics, how do we know how the world works physically? What do we know that's physical, what's not? So, epistemology really encompasses all those aspects. So, what you want to do here is explain in your paper, if you're using epistemology, say, well, we're talking about knowledge, knowledge, and that means the study of knowledge, epistemology, and how do we know or how do we justify something being true or false, right or wrong, etc. So what I want to do and what I really want you to get out of this course and out of this paper is not just a grade. Um, school is not really about shouldn't or at least shouldn't be right so i'm making an, uh <laughs> and uh sort of um ethical right or value judgment here i don't think school should be just about grades or you know uh just getting a degree or something what it's really should be about is learning becoming a better person becoming growing developing you know, really learning to flourish as an individual, coming in better than you, I guess, leaving better than you came in, right? So that's what the degree, I think, should really represent, is that you've improved yourself, you've worked, you've grown into something more than you started with. So that's what I want kind of the approach to be when uh, you're thinking about this paper. A lot of us, you know, and I remember this when I was in school that trying to figure out what I want to do in life, you know, what I want to go for, uh, what's my career going to be, what I'm going to dedicate my life to, you know, but sometimes I didn't get a lot of the information, right? It kind of, personally, I just kind of fell into philosophy and I didn't like, ever expect to be a philosopher. Uh, but I want to give you guys the opportunity to take a look at this as sort of an exploration, a personal exploration into your future career or potential career, right? So if you're interested in being a criminal justice major, if you're interested in being a psychologist, a therapist, whatever, take this chance to look into and learn more about what problems do psychologists face? What problems do um, therapists face? What problems do physicists face? face, right? And how, what's the deeper philosophical connection to that? You know, what kind of knowledge problems do they run into? What kind of metaphys excuse me, metaphysical problems do they run into? What logical problems? Uh, what social justice, you know, an artist, aesthetics, how do they determine what's beautiful or not? These are all problems that in any field you're going to face. So take this as a learning experience that you can help decide well maybe this is the right career for me or maybe it's not you can easily and this was my case you can easily go down one path uh study psychology first and then say well wait a minute you know i have bigger questions not just psychology questions i have other questions about the world and how things work and that's kind of bumped into philosophy i say well you know what we get to ask any type of questions in philosophy so maybe this is a better fit for me than just doing psychology. 
uh, now I'm doing uh, computer programming, right? So, you know, constantly growing, constantly developing. This is what you kind of want to take this paper and see, hey, is this the right fit for you? You see what they have to deal with, you see the problems uh, they try to solve. You're going to try to solve one of these problems um, with what you know, with philosophy, you know. So see how hard it is. Maybe it's not the right fit for you, or maybe you're like, definitely, it's just uh, encourages me to go further in this field. So sources that you can use other than just a textbook, because maybe you have bigger questions and bigger stuff that we weren't able to cover. Um, I suggest the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, really good resource there. Um, and I'll show you right now. Let me switch over to that screen. The Stanford is excellent in uh, providing in-depth analysis about almost anything that has to do with philosophy. Just type in any word, metaphysics, epistemology. You can kind of see from the table of contents, aesthetics of the everyday, right? African philosophy, all ethics, African ethics, like all sorts of, it's really uh, robust. So you're welcome to use that. Uh, psychology, psychology and epistemology, you see all these great things that you can uh, kind of work off of. Uh, but I will admit that it gets a little complicated. It's a little, I mean, it's very thorough. It's written by other philosophers and it's checked by other philosophers. So it's peer reviewed. So it might get a little heady and complicated. It doesn't mean you have to understand everything, but if something helps there and you want to use it, you're welcome to. Um, the other is the Encyclopedia, uh, Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And there's both links on the web, on the, excuse me, on the PowerPoint that I'll provide, because I'll provide a copy of this, uh, where you can click and you can go as well to the other encyclopedia. This one's a shorter one. It's simpler. It's still well peer reviewed, um, but it's not as heavy as maybe the Stanford. A uh, possible approach you can use maybe is that you start here with the uh, IEP and maybe you need more detail once you kind of pin down exactly what you want to talk about. And then look in the Stanford, see if you can get some good details, uh, further information about once you decide what the topic is. So those are two great sources. You're welcome to use those. Uh, I'm not one of those people where I say, well, you can use anything else. It's just very hard when you're starting out to know what's good and what's not out there on the internet, right? Uh, this is why I'm not saying you can't use the wiki at all, but sometimes the wiki is kind of shaky. It's written by a lot of different people. Some of them might not be philosophers. They might not know what they're talking about. Uh, so there might be some information that might be telling you something wrong. Um, so be careful. This is why. And, most of those wiki articles, if you look carefully, and it's about philosophy, you'll see that they reference these two websites, these two encyclopedias anyway. So why not just use the original sources that are you know are legit and trustworthy? So, and if you have any questions about any other um, uh, resources or anything like that, please email me, uh, give me a copy of the reference the link or something and so I can kind of help you navigate and see well is this legit or not uh, unfortunately there's plenty of uh, websites out there um, where people are kind of just like I'm gonna start a blog or I'm just gonna write uh, this paper for class and I'm gonna post it or something uh, and I've seen them and they're not all bad but not all of them are good either uh, there's plenty of mistakes I see as well so be conscious of that so looking at all the different stuff that we talked about and what's available in the textbook is going to be really helpful. This is why I said it's comprehensive. You might take a little bit from chapter five, you might take a look from chapter four. Uh, this is where, since we went over it and you're familiar with it, this is where you're going to show me that you've been paying attention and that you can see how it applies to real life. So there's plenty of stuff here. Um, like I said, maybe we didn't get to cover 
uh, everything there, but I think for the most part, we, we went over a lot of ground. And in Appendix C, this is going to help you as well. There's a guide on how to write a philosophy paper. So I'm giving you some tips, some overview particulars about our assignment, but more general, like how do you structure, how do you uh, start researching, how do you organize and, and come up with an outline, those kind of things. Take a look at the appendix, how to write a philosophy paper. It's going to be really helpful for that. Um, so this is a scan of the book. I have a digital copy. And you'll see if you get into uh, Appendix C, they'll give you a basic structure, how to develop your thesis, how to support that, your conclusion, the elements that you're going to need for this paper. And I'm going to go in a little more detail about that right now, but make sure you go over that. That's going to be your guide, your main guide for how to write this paper. Now steps, like it says, to write an essay in the, in the book, select a topic and narrow it to a specific issue. This is, I think, maybe the hardest thing to do in writing. Uh, I still struggle with this. You know, I might have a general idea. Well, I want to write something about psychology, for example. But I don't know how that's going to relate. And I kind of liked the chapter on artificial intelligence. So let me write about that. But see how that's not specific enough. You need to narrow it down and really get into The more precise you get, um, the easier it is to write this paper because you know exactly what you're going to talk about. If you leave it very vague, it can go in all sorts of different directions. And in the end, I've unfortunately seen this and I've done this myself early on, getting better at it, is I'm not going off on tangents. I'm not, you know, starting to talk about this and then that and then, wait, those aren't even related. And this becomes a big monster of a paper. And I'm like, oh, I'm never going to finish this. Spend a lot of time on one and two, narrowing down exactly what you want to talk about. So uh, this is an example, self-driving cars, right? Uh, we're using what they call AI to program self-driving cars. Well, what happens if a self-driving car and this actually happen if it hits somebody, right? Who's at fault here? The programmer, the person, you know, the person behind the wheel, even if they're not driving. See how you get ethical issues, philosophy of mind, right? Free will, all these things that we talk about in that. So even get even narrower, like get really specific. Take a really particular issue that, let's say, the people who are making the cars are dealing with right now and go into depth about well what are they doing that's the research part so once i talk about you know um are self-driving cars hurting people have they hit people then get into particular cases research online see if you can identify well what was a particular case where this happened what were the researchers talking about you know so th those are all great things to kind of really know your scope uh, it's it's really tedious. I'm not going to play around. It, sometimes it gets really boring because you have to go over like all these little articles and finally narrow it down. But trust me, it'll make your life and this paper a lot easier. The better you do one and two, you're going to be able to develop three real easy. Uh, outline is just going to follow through, and then just writing your drafts. Just polishing it which should be the easiest part. So when you develop your thesis, and this is where you go back to uh, three, right? Write a thesis statement. And it'll go more into the book as well, but I want to show you and kind of guide you through. A thesis paper, of, which is an argument paper, that's what we're writing, your thesis is the, the, basically the conclusion, what you're trying to prove. And your premises are your reasons that you're going to back up these theses. So going, this is why I say going all the way back to logic. Remember, we talked about premises and a conclusion. That's how we make an argument. You're doing the same thing here, uh, but in a paper form. 
So it's, this is going to be, the weird thing about it is that your conclusion in your paper, your thesis is going to come first. It's going to be in the first paragraph. It's not going to be at the very end in the same way. Well, in summary, you're going to mention it again, of course, but what you're going to tell your reader, your audience, and remember, your audience doesn't necessarily mean it's just going to be me. This should be for anybody who's interested. You have to write for a general audience. You know, what is this paper about? This is why getting really particular, getting really precise about what you're talking about makes it easier for people to understand you. So, and I'll show you right now in the outline how it kind of goes in reverse. But first thing you should do when you get to step three, really flush out your thesis. Your thesis is usually just a sentence or two long. It's a little bigger than that. <clears throat> and you usually put it in your first paragraph so you let your reader know, like I said. Um, this also helps to see if your reader is interested or not. This is not a murder mystery. You're not trying to do a twist or something with your reader, trick your reader. Uh, instead, you're supposed to be upfront and honest right away. Um, I know one of my uh, former professors used to tell us that writing a thesis paper is like writing the worst mystery like novel ever because you give away the end at the beginning. So that's what you're essentially doing. And so I'll give you an example of what a thesis would look like. So can't use this thesis because I'm already given an example, but this is supposed to give you an idea. So it says, uh, I want to study animal psychology. So let's imagine this student wants to do that. However, the issues of the issue of which animals should be considered conscious arises. Using philosopher Thomas Nagel's concept of conscious, um, I will sh should probably say consciousness, right? I will show it possible to determine if some animals are conscious or not for the following reasons. So that's what I'm talking about, is that one little paragraph, but I'm already seeing where this paper is going. I, don't, I already understand what this paper is about. It's about animal psychology. Um, this person is asking, uh, you know, what animals, how do we know if an animal is like, uh, sentient or conscious or not, you know, is the bacteria count, uh, do snails count, right? It's going to be kind of tough. And we talked about Nagel and philosophy of mind, you know, in his bat uh, example. So this is how they're going to use one of the uh, philosophers to help them with their problem, right? Figuring out which con what, what is conscious or not in and animal psychology. Well, how do we work that? And they're going to show that uh, for the following reasons. They haven't got to the reasons yet because that's their premises, but we have a clear thesis, right? We can even sharpen it and make it even clearer if we work on it. And I suggest that you do, but this is just to give you an idea. Automatically, two sentences, I know where they're going. I know if I'm going to be interested in this paper or not, and if I want to continue reading. So that's what you want to do here. So spend your time. It looks like already that they got one and two down, right? They try to specify exactly what they're going to talk about. And they already did some research about Nagel, uh, maybe some animal psychology. And so they already got some reasons and some facts to start working from. The next is to create an outline. And this is what I'm going to say. The outline is the backwards version of a formal argument that we talked about. So we have the reasons first, and then we have the conclusion. Now we're going backwards. We started with the conclusion, like I said, and then we go to the reasons. So that's what it's going to look like here. You're going to start with your thesis, right? Automatically tell me, just like we did with that example. Then the next step is you're going to take for the following reasons why, you know, is Nagel's philosophy going to help us decide? Well, reason number one, and then you basically tell me in one sentence. You're going to go later into detail, but 
in the introduction, that's what you should be explaining to me. Reason number two, you know, the next sentence. Uh, reason three. Now, for this paper, um, two to three reasons is, is sufficient. Uh, technically, you're not limited by how many reasons. Uh, you could do a million reasons or whatever, but I think for this paper and for how much time we have, two to three is sufficient. Uh, one, it's going to be a really weak argument. This means you only have one thing to talk about or one reason to believe something. Uh, you want to make it stronger than that. Um, and then more than three, like four or five, like it's a little complicated. So I want to keep it in that range. And then section three of the intro says a small roadmap of your essay. Well, what does that mean? It's a preview of what you're going to cover. You're just going to explain to your reader. This is why, again, it's the worst mystery novel ever, because you're going to tell them in that last paragraph what you're going to do in this paper. So, well, first, I'm going to explain uh, the background, and this is where we're going to get into the body right now, but it's what we call stage setting. You're going to give me uh, the background for what's going on here. Uh, then you say, well, and then next I'm going to provide you, you know, an explanation of Nagel's philosophy. We'll go continue with that example. And then after explaining Nagel and explaining what, you know, uh, programmers or psychologists have to do with, or animal behavior, whatever your thing is, how to give me the background information, because I don't know, I'm going to pretend I don't know anything about this subject. Then you're going to start with your first reason that you've already seen, but you're going to go into detail, right? Say, well, the reason it's going to help us is because reason number one, and then explain, go into it, right? That's, you see, that's the second part. And then reason two, how that's going to work. And this is where we haven't talked about that much. Uh, but it's still important, and, and the book talks about it in Appendix C, is you don't have to have an objection. So you have to make it a balanced paper. You can't simply just say, well, this is what I believe. There you go. I want to see, well, what does the other side have to say? If you're really thinking about a paper, if you're really thinking about the topic, you're also anticipating what the other side is going to say. What is their reasoning going to be if they argue against you, right? And they say, oh, Nagel doesn't work. It's not going to help why it's not going to help. Well, they, they would probably explain why. So that's where you need at least a, one objection. Now, what is sufficient? If you have two, three objections, more objections, but you have answers to all those objections, that actually makes a stronger paper, I'm going to admit. Uh, you don't have to do more than one necessarily, but uh, that's kind of a a very strong suggestion. If you have more and you have answers, responses to those, a counterexample, then that's going to be a much more convincing paper, right? So by the end, when I get to the conclusion as your reader, I should be convinced that you're right about what you were arguing, about your argument. Yeah, I see your conclusion. I see for the reasons and your answers to what other people would say and how that really makes sense now what you're saying and why it works. That's how I should leave this paper. So in the end, you're trying to convince your reader, including myself, that you're right about what you stated you were going to prove. Prove what you said you were going to prove. This is why I said it's kind of like a court case in that sense, is that you're like a lawyer. They start off the case. I'm going to show that my client is innocent. He's not guilty of murder or whatever. And that's their introduction, right? And they go through all those months, uh, weeks and months about showing why that for this reason and that reason, they get a background right. Uh, and then finally they say, and as I show in the court and the closing statements, this is why my client is innocent of murder. He could, he could have possibly committed the murder. He was at this location and blah, 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 right? So that's exactly what you're doing here. You're you're tying it all up in and showing that it was a solid case at the end. So coming back to the roadmap, it's just a preview. You're, you're just telling me what steps you're doing. So first, you're going to explain the background of mind uploading. This is one possible paper I had students write about uh, and what theory that they were going to use. So you give me the background, you know, and, and in this, in your case here, you're going to 
you're going to do the same thing, right? It's like, well, what's animal psychology about in this example? You know, explain animal psychology. Use your sources that you've researched to do that. Um, what did Thomas Nagel say about consciousness? You're going to take your source, right? Either from the encyclopedia or from the textbook. You know, what was his argument about consciousness? And then you start connecting the pieces together, right? So that's what we call stage setting. Get into the reasons. That's what you're going to do romance. So first I'm going to set the stage by blah, blah, blah. Then I'm going to give the following reasons. Then I'm going to entertain an objection. You know, what somebody might say against this, saying that they... Nagel was incorrect about what he says, and but then you have a comeback, right? This is your response. You always have to have a comeback in philosophy. This is showing that you're really thinking that this is why I should believe what you're saying. Say, well, I see their point, but they didn't think of this, and this is why it doesn't really affect my argument. It's not a really good reason that they uh, provided against what I'm saying here. And then at the end, you just, like I said, tie it up finish your closing arguments, this is why, uh, such and such uh, thesis argument is a correct one and and why you should support it, I showed all that, and, and so this is how we can determine, you know, whether an animal is conscious or not. Great, that's it. So use this outline, this is not just for me to talk about it, um, like it's, it's a little bit more maybe expanded than the one you find in the textbook, but the more you time that you dedicate to developing your outline, the easier the work is going to be. Uh, don't make the mistake, and I think I made this mistake when I first started college, is that you know I kind of sit in front of the computer and then I'm like I'm just waiting for the ideas to come and then magic will happen and then I'll get it all done and I don't have a plan and I'm not sure what to write about, but I'll just start typing not always works and what happens is we tend to procrastinate we're human beings we start looking at our phone you know there's a game or something we start getting distracted and then we're like three hours later it's like oh, i still don't have anything i'm not sure and then it's like the night before and then now you're trying to finish it you know you're taking a bunch of energy drinks and you're trying to just type anything to submit it and of course when i read it i'm gonna be like really obvious that you're on energy drinks and you're trying to submit whatever ideas came to you that night because it's not going to flow. It's not going to make sense completely. You're not going to think about possible problems with your program or like your paper, right? Thinking like a programmer. And so think about it like that, that do a little bit of time. Bill, this is your blueprint. This is when you build the house, right? Come up with the blueprint. First, don't just start building because it's going to be wonky. It's going to use the wrong, you took the measurements wrong, it's going to crook it. You know, or the other analogy I like to use is it's like a bank. You know, try to rob a bank without a plan. Probably not going to go very well. Uh, that's why in the movies, right, the, the best bank robbers are the ones who are all worked it out completely. That's what you're doing here with Bradley. Now, there's the issue of plagiarism, and I want to talk about this. I don't think the book talks about it very well. Now, of course, heads up, this is not a secret. Uh, when you submit a paper online to me, the, pro, uh, the, the system, Blackboard, checks, it has a plagiarism checker. It already scans and tells me exactly where everything is coming from. Notice this with some mistakes and some people's discussions, like I wouldn't notice that this came from a website or something. It scans everything, as you can see. This is an example here of the program. It tells me how many words are in it, tells me how much of it was plagiarized, where the website came from, links to it, it breaks it down for me. So don't just assume that I won't notice. I've been teaching for a long time, I've been doing philosophy for even longer. Uh, writing papers, longer than that, and and now there's programs to help me too. So uh, the chances of trying to trick me and get by are really slim. So I say like five percent or six percent, right? 
like you're it's gonna be really hard you know i wouldn't take it as a challenge it's kind of like when you know this is not a good idea and probably shouldn't go down that route so this is take this as a warning and a heads up that you know paraphrasing putting things in your own words is really important learning to take information make it simpler and then communicate it to others is the real point here uh just copy and pasting what somebody else said is not the point because if they're confused with the information or the or the original source and you just say exactly what that source said to them well that didn't help the confusion they're still confused right which i'm going to pretend when i grade these papers i don't know anything about the subject uh this is all new to me and so if i'm confused that's not a good sign for the paper so what is proper paraphrasing i think maybe some students maybe were never taught or they kind of ignored it or it just didn't sink in so let me give you quick examples of what i'm looking for and why uh, some things are better paraphrased than others so obviously paraphrasing is not just changing some of the words around you know putting this sentence second instead of first and pre that's not putting your own words it's just like mixing it up hoping i would have noticed uh or omitting just taking out stuff like okay this three sentences oh i just took out the middle sentence and i put saved the first and third one well still not it's still the same right still oh i'll just change one word or two not helping it's still basically the same let me show you what i mean So this is an example from philosophy written by David Hume. Hume is one of my favorite philosophers, ultimate skeptic. And he wrote a lot about the mind and thoughts and ideas, philosophy of mind stuff. And he says in one of his books, all the perceptions of human mind resolve themselves into two distinct kinds, which I shall call impressions and ideas. The difference betwixt these consists in the degrees of force and liveliness with which they strike upon the mind and make their way into our thought or consciousness. Those perceptions which enter with the most force and violence, we may name impressions. And under this name, I comprehend all our sensations, passions, and emotions as they make their first appearance in the soul. By ideas, I mean the faith images of these in thinking and reason. Kind of complicated, right? Maybe, I don't know, I kind of get it, but I don't know exactly what he's trying to say. So let's look at an example of where somebody would try to paraphrase this. Somebody might say, okay, this is my version of what he's saying. Hume says all perceptions of the mind are resolved into two kinds, impressions and ideas. The difference is in how much force and liveliness they have in our thoughts and consciousness. The perception with the most force and violence are impressions. These are sensations, passions, and emotions. Ideas are the fake images of our thinking and reasoning. So do we now understand what he's talking about? Is this a really good version of what he said? The answer to that is no. This is not. Because if I'm confused what he was talking about, well, I'm still kind of confused because they're still using the same words. They're still, it's, they just put some sentences there, took out other information, but I'm not really clear what Hume was talking about. What, do you, what does he mean? What's the difference between these things he's talking about? Now, a better version would be, Hume says that the two kinds of perceptions or mental states, so a state where the mind can, mentally can be, right? He calls these impressions and ideas. Okay, so there's two types of things. Impressions, ideas, there's two kind of states that we can be in. An impression is a very forceful mental state, like the sensory impression when one has looking at a red apple. Oh, now I see. Notice what the reader, I'm oh, sorry, the writer did here. They have an example to make it even simpler for me. So what does he mean by a very forceful mental state? like sensory impression what's the sensory impression oh it's what's happening when i'm looking at a red apple 
excuse me. But an idea is a less forceful mental state, like the idea one has of an apple while just thinking about it rather than looking at it. So if I just close my eyes and I think about what an apple looks like, see how it's not as direct, see how it's kind of maybe a little uh, vague right in your mind. You don't see it as clearly as you do if you're looking at it directly. So your mind is doing two different things there. It's not so clear what he means here by forceful. He might mean, and this is where maybe some interpretation comes in, because he, of course, passed away, so you know, we don't know what exactly it means, but there's an interpretation. But well, what he's saying here sounds like this is what it means by forceful. So this is a much better explanation. This is why I would say this. This is where they really put into their own words. And if I was confused, now I better understand what's going on. Easy examples that anybody can relate to. This is what you're going for. So take note. This is why first one is not what you want to do. Second one is what you want to go for. Now, let's try with one more example. And this comes from Aristotle. But through our present account is of this nature. We must give what we can first, and then us, let us consider this. What is the nature of such things to be destroyed by defect and excess, as we see in the case of strength and of health? So too is it that in the case of temperance and courage and the other virtues, for the man who flies from and fears everything and does not stand his ground against anything becomes a coward, and the man who fears nothing at all that goes to meet every danger becomes rash. Now, just so we can pause the video, take a second to go over it. Think about how you would paraphrase this. You can even write it down on a piece of paper. Think of how you would make it simpler using examples, putting your own words. And then after you pause it, after you do that, come back to the video and we'll see how I can break it down. What's my version? Okay, so hopefully you pause it, right? And you give yourself some time to try to do it. So what is Aristotle talking about here? Well, he talks about things in nature, right? He says, first let us consider this. That is the nature of such things to be destroyed by defect and excess. So if you have too little of something, a defect, right? It's going to fall apart. It's going to be destroyed. If you have too much, it's still going to be it's still going to fall apart and be destroyed, right? So what does it sound like? You should need a balance to something, right? Not too much, not too little. That's how you keep things going. And what does he mean by the second part? Well, as we see in this case of strength and of health. So how can strength and health be good examples of having too much or too little and, and you destroy your strength or you destroy your health? Well, I can come up with a really easy example. Working at the gym, and I've seen this, you know, some people when they go to the gym, they do like two reps, right? They lift it two times, and then it's like they just spend the rest of the hour on their phone taking up the machine. Well, obviously, they're not going to gain strength and not working on their health, right? And then I've seen the other side, right, where too much. So they try to lift too much weight, more than they can really at that time. They're not working it up, right? Uh, they're trying to get healthy too fast, like these uh, sort of like diet programs or whatever. They're trying to like rush it because uh, it actually takes time right, for your body to change. So in that process, they've destroyed their strength and health. What's the right thing? should need a balance, right? Low uh, sort of like, you know, incremental Little by little, it gets better. And so that happens. You can see that, right, in the gym. So what Aristotle is saying, well, it's not just the gym. You can see this happen with the virtues. Talked about Aristotle's virtues. Um, when he talks about courage or temperance. And courage he uses as, a, as an example. It's like, well, if you're courageous, right, you're, you have that virtue. Well, what happens when you have too little? Well, then you're a coward, right? You're always running away from any situation. Obviously, you're not courageous. 
but then what would be the excess or be too much? Well, when you rush into everything, you don't even think about it. That's not courage. That's becoming just rash. That's dumb. You're not thinking about it. Uh, what would be an example? Well, an example could be, you know, if you see somebody across the street being attacked, right? Physically, uh, you want to help them. Well, let's say they're being attacked by five individuals, right? One person's being, well, running away from the situation, just pretending you didn't see anything. Obviously, you're not courageous, you're being a coward, you need to help that person. But on the other side, running and trying to beat up five people at once, probably not smart either, right? That would be too rash. That's not a good approach to help them. Now you're just now you just got beat up along with the person, right? You didn't really help them. So what would be the best thing? Maybe calling for help, be calling the police, be calling other people for help, something like that, right? Where you're helping them. You can see this in a lot of cases with police brutality as well, right? Um, what did people do to help? Well, trying to fight the cops themselves probably wouldn't go well, right? So what could they do in that situation? This is really important to Aristotle's philosophy. Based on the context, maybe reporting the situation, right? Trying to talk or do something. Um, doesn't mean it's always perfect, but definitely I think uh, to the people who reported, who even though it was from the cops, people who try to document it, uh, those were courageous acts. Those were things that they were doing to help. So. This is how I broke down this particular thing. And this is what the kind of breakdown you want to do for yourself when you're reading something. Now, part of the book is uh, talks about this, but I really want to make sure I emphasize this because students, I feel like every semester there are some students who just completely ignore this. When you cite, and this is a cited paper that's part of the instructions, if you look on Blackboard, you need to cite where you got this information from. Even if you paraphrased, which you should, right? You need to put in your own words, like this example. At the end, I need to have citations. Of where did you get this information from? What book perfumes did you get this from? What pages? So this is an example, and I'll glad to show this PowerPoint as well. It's from another professor, but it's really good where you should have in-text citations. This is so I'm not searching all over the place to find out where you got this information from, right? So it says, ideas in contrast are private in that each belongs to only one individual and are dependent on their bearers. In that they were the bearer of an idea not to exist, the idea would not exist either. Well, who was talking about that? This very famous philosopher, German philosopher called Frege. He wrote this in 1918, and it's in the book on pages 41 and 42. That I should have. So I said you can do MLA or APA citation style, up to you. Um, but I will be looking for citations. If you just include all this information and there's no page numbers or no author, there's no year, just nothing, um, those are points off. It's definitely going to hurt your paper and your grade. You also need a bibliography. So which book of Frege's are they talking about? Frege wrote a lot of books. So if it just says Frege, you just put the last name. But let's say you're using two different books. Well, then how am I going to tell? Mention the year. So of course, it's and this is a good example, too. And you probably use this with the textbook as well. Originally, Frege's long passed away. He lived in the 1800s. So um, he originally wrote this in 1892 and the other book in, or the other paper in, in 1918. But obviously that person who wrote this paper doesn't have a copy maybe of something that's like 100 years old. So where did they get this from? Well, they probably got it from a reprint, something that was like a reprint of all his famous papers from 2008. So that's why they would include two dates there. So same thing as the textbook, right? Um, you know, what's the original? Uh, if you're saying exactly from some particular philosopher, and then when was the textbook 
uh, published as well. And then you give the title, right? Uh, you're going to give what edition of the author, right? What edition? So philosophy of language seems like that's the whole book. On sense in uh, no minutum? I don't remember that paper. <laughs> I gotta look back, but um, that's the particular paper of Frege's that they have in that book, right? So the big book is the philosophy of language. Uh, Frege's paper in that book is called On Sense and No Minutum. I'm gonna have to look on that, but I'm kind of curious. Uh, and who did that? Well, the editor who put this together. That's their name, right? And um, what pages, uh, this is going to tell us what pages they use. Uh, the publisher, it was from Oxford University, University Press. So that's where the, the, uh, the redid, right? The 2008 book is from. And so I need this information. So when I'm looking, I'll say Frega 1918, okay. What was this or what, what, what book was this? I can see, oh, 1918, the thought, a logical inquiry. That's where they got these pages from. This is what they're talking about. It's not the first book. So even though it's the same author, different book. I need in-text citations and I need, excuse me, a bibliography at the very end of your paper. And that's a whole new page. You start, you skip, like when you're at the very end of the conclusion, you skip to the next clean page, and that's where you put your resources, your bibliography page. Don't just tap it, tag it onto the very last paragraph. It needs its own title. It needs its own page. So make sure you do that. If you have questions about that, happy to help. Uh, how are we going to grade this paper? So once you have it all done, everything checked, everything, have all your sources, uh, the criteria is going to be based on uh, exceptional, satisfactory, needs improvement, or poor. This is where like, there's a grading scale of like how much I'm going to give you based on what, on what criteria, formatting. So that you meet all the parts of the required checklist. So on the assignment, you'll look, you have these little boxes, and it says things like, oh, how many words should it be? Uh, what font should you use? If you followed all the instructions correctly and you can check off all the boxes for yourself, you're like, oh, I did this, I did this, whatever, before you turn it in, that's easy 35% of the paper. Great. Doing a great job so far. If you start being lazy, not careful, you forgot to cite, you forgot to put a bibliography, it's going to hurt you. Those are where the 35% is going to come from. Uh, grammar. Again, this is college. Uh, there's great resources. There's that program that's available to every all students. Grammarly can help you look over your grammar. Uh, it's I know everybody. We're all human. We all make mistakes with grammar. But when you're proofreading, you're turning something in. Don't just turn it in and it's like, oh, I'm sure it's fine. If I start to see a lot of grammatical mistakes. It's going to start hurting. That's going to be 15% of the entire paper. So take a look. Almost no. Let's say you got one. Fine. Not a big deal. Mm, I had five grammatical mistakes. That's going to knock you down some points. Uh, wait a minute. Now you've got almost half of the paper. Let's say 40% of the paper is you have grammatical mistakes not looking good and then finally very poor it's like most of the paper has grammatical mistakes so pay attention always have somebody else look not just programs not just the writing department which you can use as well but have somebody else friends or family read it out loud take a look if there's something that especially if you're doing it on a computer it's really easy to not catch things so don't just trust your eyes. I still send things to my friends, fellow philosophers, you know, before I submit something because, you know, I might not see it. I just been thinking about all these ideas so much that I, I won't even really realize it. Um, organization. 
how did you organize the paper? If you followed the outline, if you followed what the book was saying and this kind of structure, you'll do great because I'll be looking for all these parts. If you skip some stuff, you didn't put an objection, you didn't start with the thesis or you left your thesis to the very end and you never brought it up, you forgot to put your reasons, that all is going to hurt you. So I'm giving you almost exact step-by-step -step placement instructions where you want to put things so that it can move smoothly. And then let's come back. And then the last part here is example. So these are your reasons. This is how good your thesis is. Did you convince me based on what you were saying? That's where 35% of the grade is going to be. If you just kind of snapped it together at the last minute, like I said, and just waited to the last, the day before, the night before, not going to be good, right? You could possibly lose 35% of the entire final grade right there because um, you didn't really think about it. It's obvious. You kind of BSed it. It's pretty obvious to me. I've been doing this for a while. Uh, I do this for a living. <laughs> You know, like I write philosophy, I do this for a living, so it's easy for me to see when somebody's BS. It's kind of my job to point out when other philosophers try to get away with stuff, right? I'm quick on that. I'm saying, oh, wait a minute, that doesn't quite make sense. Now, I'm, at this point, it's just natural to me to do that. So don't just trust, oh, I'm sure he won't notice. Uh, I wouldn't put money on that. So be careful with that, okay? But I'm not here just to, you know, give you bad grades or whatever. That's not my job. Uh, my job is to help you get better grades, to help you do the best paper you can. And remember the original point to this whole thing, assignment was to help you see if maybe this is the right career path for you. If you decide after this paper, like, oh, it's much more complicated or just you know what, I got really bored at the end. I'm not really interested in psychology. I'm not really interested in criminal justice like I thought it was. This is a good time to maybe, you know, turn directions. Go for something you really like. Um, because in the end, it's your life. And now, you know, you kind of have to live with your choices. So use this opportunity. Okay. And with that, uh, I'm going to end this uh, video. Uh, let me know. Um, if you need any help, particular questions about research, assignment, the assignment, um, resources, we would check. Um, if, you wrote a, uh, if you wrote a first draft, you say, oh, okay, how's this looking? Welcome to look at anything like that. Just send me emails to my official uh, EPCC email address. Not the Blackboard one, it's messy. Just send it to my original address that's in the syllabus, okay? And uh, I'll include a copy of this PowerPoint as well in Blackboard. So I uh, wish you guys luck, and I'll see you guys next time.